All right. Hello, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and welcome. Um, we are here tonight to talk about a really important topic in uh, the Maryland climate movement, um, uh, planning process that the state is undergoing right now, and how can we can make sure that uh, that plan achieves as much emissions reductions as possible without doing harm by entrenching uh, polluting industries that uh, harm our air quality and our water quality in communities throughout Maryland. Um, so we're getting started right now with a quick introduction of who is joining us tonight. Um, so my name is Jennifer Kunze. I'm the Maryland Organizing Director at Clean Water Action, um, and I live here in Baltimore City in East Baltimore. Clean Water Action is a national environmental organization that has been around as you see in our logo for 50 years, uh, fighting for not only clean water, but also clean air and healthy communities in um, the states throughout the country that we work in, including here in Maryland. And our Maryland office does a lot of work on um, solid waste management policy, as well as other waste management policies, with a particular focus on fighting trash incinerators and building up composting. Um, so that is Clean Water Action. I'll turn it over to Shoshanda from the South Baltimore Community Land Trust. Hi, everybody. Uh, my video is not sharing, but I am Shoshanda with the South Baltimore Community Land Trust. Um, we have we work around um, environmental justice in South Baltimore um, is where a lot of our work has taken place. But we have done some citywide plans like the Civil Waste Plan in Baltimore City um, that has been adopted by council. Um, and we are focusing also on permanent affordable housing um, and just trying to like do all of the things that should actually be human rights to people um, in communities. So we're super excited to be a part of this webinar um, and helping host and happy to you all are here. Great, and um, Carlos as well. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Carlos Sanchez. I am also a, a recent full-time employee with um, the South Baltimore Community Land Trust. Uh, I've done a lot of work with um, environmental organizing in the in South Baltimore, and as well, um, and a lot of outreach. So, yeah, that's me. Great, and we're also joined by um, special guests who are going to talk about particular special issues uh, in parallel with the trash incineration and zero waste issues uh, later on in the program. Um, Sonia and Maria, would you want to say a quick hello? Uh, sure, thank you. I'll start real quick. Um, my name is Sonia Demery. I'm with the Climate Communications Coalition, and we are also part of um, this big team that is trying to uh, fix the environment around uh, trash incineration and um, waste. And, and I will be talking about woody biomass for energy. Thank you. And Maria? Hi, I'm Maria Payan. Uh, I am with Shen and Sesh. Shen is Sussex Health and Environmental Network. Sesh is Sentinels of Eastern Shore Health. Um, as you can probably guess, we are located on the Delmarva Peninsula and work throughout Delaware and in the Lower Eastern Shore of Maryland. And we are happy to stand with um, these warriors uh, for clean air and clean water. We're all doing the same thing, trying to get basic human rights, which should be part of our rights. <laughs> and um, uh, that's that's our story, our continued story for decades. I'm gonna keep going until we get it. <laughs> Absolutely, yep. Um, so a quick word about the agenda tonight, walking you through, uh, we'll be talking first about what is the Climate Pathway Report. If you pay very close attention to climate politics, you may have been hearing about it before, but if not, don't worry, we will walk you through it. Um, then second, we're going to talk about why we want to talk about solid waste management and waste management in general as part of climate action. Moving away from trash incineration and away from landfilling towards zero waste is an absolutely critical part of climate action and needs to be a big part of any climate program that the state is putting together. Uh, part three will be what's in the climate report what is in there that should not be, and what's missing that should be. Uh, we think that there's a lot of room for the Climate Pathway Report to recommend more policies, 
to achieve more emissions reductions through waste management, um, as well as a lot of room for improvement in how it deals with trash incineration and biogas and biomass. Then finally, the real reason you all are here, how to take action. We'll talk through um, ways that you can help to shape the climate pathway report over the coming month and then answer all of your questions. Uh, so again, thank you so much for being here and we'll get started with part one. So what is the climate pathway report? This is a report that the state released this summer uh, in draft form. This plan was required by legislation that passed last year called the Climate Solutions Now Act, big omnibus legislation that achieve, uh, accomplished a lot of um, forward movement and planning for climate change. And one of the things that the Climate Solutions Now Act required the state to do was to study how we would achieve as a state 60% greenhouse gas emissions reductions by 2031, ratcheting down our emissions by 60% uh, in about the next decade, and then how we could achieve net zero by 2045. And so the Climate Pathway Report models where we're at now and where we'll get with the policies that are currently on the books, and then based on those models, then makes recommendations for further policies that can meet those goals. The timeline we're on right now is that, uh, like I mentioned, the Climate Solutions Now Act passed uh, in spring of 2022 through the state legislature. Then in June of this year, the draft Climate Pathway Report is released, and we are about halfway through the point right now of listening sessions and feedback. There have been several listening sessions across the state already um, where people can give feedback, including a special one for elected officials just uh, earlier this week, um, as well as uh, the opportunity to submit written comments online. So that's continuing through the end of September. And then in December 2023, the Maryland Department of the Environment will be processing all of that and releasing a final report. And then that report is really important because it will be the foundation of future climate action policies uh, at the state level in Maryland. And uh, before we get into the details, um, for any of y'all who want to read the report yourself, it is worth diving into if you want to take a close look. I want to walk you through how to read it because there's a lot of different things going on in this report. It's very long and very uh, covers a lot of ground. So the report overall is broken up into the different sectors that you see on the left. And it's looking at sort of a whole of society approach, um, at least how it's broken up in these sections of within all of these different sectors of the economy. What are the current policies on the books? How far are they going to get us? And what more do we need to do? And then on the right, you'll see the sections that are inside of each of these sectors. Uh, the modeled policies, sort of doing the modeling to understand what policies are already on the books and how far um, will those policies reduce our emissions. Then the really key thing, and the reason the thing that is highlighted here is the additional policies. That is what the report is recommending Maryland do beyond what it's already planning to do to meet those emissions reductions goals and get us to net zero. Um, then it also gives some more details on the modeling, uh, gives some considerations for policy implementation, talking about some barriers and opportunities, and gives a case study for each section. Uh, so what we're really zeroing in on today is the waste management section. And what is really key for those is the additional policy section, which we will show you itself in just a minute. But first, we want to talk about why do we care about zero waste and waste management when we're talking about climate, climate change and climate action? What are the ways that zero, zero waste approach can drive emissions reductions and why is this so important? But to talk about that, first we need to talk about what zero waste even is. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to Carlos from South Baltimore Land Trust to talk about that. 
Thank you, Jennifer. And yeah, so so Gaia's definition of what zero waste and climate action is, is zero waste systems are versatile strategies that aim to continually reduce waste through source reduction, separation collection, composting, and recycling. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. And Gaia's um, also created this um, zero waste to zero emissions report that explains how zero waste is an essential part of any climate plan because it will deliver rapid benefits for, for um, meth reduction and avoiding global warming. And according to the report, zero waste can cut waste sector emissions by an average of 84%, which is like taking all the motor vehicles off the road in the United States for like a year. Again, passing it back on to Absolutely. Yeah. So um, we this report is a really, really great resource. Um, we'll put the link to it in the comment in the chat, as well as the link to the climate pathway report itself. If any of the panelists, other panelists have that on hand and could answer that in the Q&A, that would be awesome. Um, this is a really fantastic resource if you want to do a deep dive into how much we really can do in the solid waste management sector to drive down emissions. We're just going to give you some of the cream off the top of the what all of the content that's in the report here tonight. Um, but first, before we get into the opportunities, we need to talk about where we are now. And where we are now in the solid waste management world is uh, we're causing a lot of emissions by how we handle our trash. Um, trash generally goes to one of two places, and the default and the place that mo most local communities in Maryland send our trash is to the landfill. Uh, landfills are huge climate emitter emitters. It's a really, really significant problem. Um, they're the third largest source of man-made, human-made methane, um, and methane is a really powerful greenhouse gas, much more powerful at causing warming in the short term than CO2. And landfills themselves contribute about 20% of human-caused methane emissions. This is a really big problem, especially for the short-term climate change that we're going to see in the next couple of decades. Methane emissions, including those from landfills, are really going to drive how bad things get in terms of climate change within our lifetimes and in the next couple of decades. So getting um, reducing methane emissions from landfills is absolutely critical um, to averting climate disasters. And this is act also an underappreciated problem until recently. Um, the Environmental Integrity Project put out a report last year that showed that the actual methane emissions from Maryland landfills were much, much higher than the state had been modeling up until that point. Um, this is really a huge problem that the state is now taking much more action on, but even much more action needs to be taken. And um, the really important thing, and something we're gonna talk about much more in the next couple of minutes is what creates these methane emissions. Um, methane doesn't isn't caused by absolutely everything that you put in the landfill, it's not caused by your plastic waste, it's not caused by um, sort of artificial projects, pro products, those are a different kind of problem, um, but it's caused by organic waste, um, not organic in the food sense, uh, in the sense of organic produce that you can buy, but in the sense of anything that comes from a plant or animal, your food scraps, your paper, anything that would decompose in the natural environment, is going to produce methane when it's trapped inside of a landfill. Um, so that's what we really need to be looking at to get rid of landfill methane emissions. And fortunately, zero waste has a really good solution that we're gonna be talking about in a minute. The other thing is that we currently majorly do with our waste is burn it. And anybody who has heard Clean Water Action or South Baltimore Land Trust talk before knows um, what we have to say about trash incinerators. Trash incinerators are enormously polluting, both in terms of climate change and in terms of um, local health where incinerators are. Here in Maryland, we have two trash incinerators, one here in Baltimore City uh, that is in South Baltimore near the casino on Russell Street, and that's what you see pictured here, as well as one over in Montgomery County. And 
you'll hear a lot from the companies that do burn trash or want to burn trash about why they'll say that these incinerators aren't so bad for the climate or aren't so bad for local air quality. Um, they'll point to methane emissions from landfills and say that incinerators at least get rid of that. They'll point to other sources of air pollution in Baltimore and say, oh, incinerators aren't so big of a problem. But really, incinerators are massively polluting and they're a huge problem for, um, for local air quality. Here's some more analysis by our friends at the Environmental Integrity Project. They looked at trash incinerators as a source of electricity and what kind of impact those have on air quality here in Baltimore and in Montgomery County as a source of electricity. So when you look at how much electricity is the incinerator producing versus other sources of electricity that everyone acknowledges is bad. So if you hold it up against the fossil fuel powered plants in Maryland, the coal plants that you see here in this report, when you look, compare it by the amount of energy that each one produces, the incinerator, the incinerator here in Baltimore produces 44 times more mercury, mercury and 160, uh, sorry, the Baltimore incinerator produces 160 times more mercury and six times more nitrogen oxides than the coal plants that we have in Maryland. Both of these are incredibly bad for people's health. And this really shows that if we're looking at electricity production and how we're going to produce energy in the future, if, we, if everybody acknowledges, as everybody does, that we can't keep burning coal, then we absolutely can't afford to keep burning trash to produce our energy. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, and I think that it's like, as you just heard a lot about why incinerators are not the solution, um, but has been what we have been relying on for a long time. Um, if that wasn't enough, actually, it is the most polluting way to actually get electricity. Um, and even more ridiculous, it is actually being considered renewable and clean. So it's getting $40 million in subsidies from um, our renewable portfolio, which many people have been arguing why it should not be getting that, as you heard all of the um, all of the pollutants that it actually produced and emissions. Um, it's just not a way that we can continue to actually deal with that waste. You can go to the next slide, Jennifer. Um, and as we see, like, as I said before, it is not the most effective way of dealing with the waste because it does release this when burning plastics, um, uh, 1.4 tons of CO2, um, which is really bad, of course, for our health. Um, but, um, it's also just not, it's also, you know, not needed because if we really look at what we're producing, um, with the indisposal of it, like plastics with the indisposal of being burnt, um, we can really stop doing that. Um, you put the next one, Jennifer. Um, and so let's talk about why the zero waste movement is very important to the climate action. Because you know, a lot of times you hear these two things separately. You might hear climate action, then you hear like zero waste, as if they're not part of the same things. Um, and so, what you see here on this this iceberg is that at the top of the iceberg, what you see is the solid waste that's being uh, that's accounting for greenhouse gases between three to five percent. Um, and that's all of the things we were just talking about um, that's being burned, that's being buried. Um, and how we see this zero waste movement actually being helpful to this is because at the bottom of that iceberg is actually addressing all of the things that's not actually included in that three to 5% of emissions. Um, because um, if you go to the next slide for me, Jennifer, really quickly, if you actually go, um, if you actually look at what's being produced, um, there is 70% of that actually is the life cycle of products. So that's like the plastics, right? All these different things that's being produced with the indisposal of actually being landfilled or incinerated, uh, which is the common way that we deal with it. Um, if we actually just stop doing that um, and actually use zero waste as the solution um, by looking at what we can, which I'll talk more about, but what looking at how do we separate these sources um, of waste that we are producing where they go into their own bins and things like that, that we can deal with them separately, then we can actually address products and even looking at the redesigning of products um, that are being produced with the indisposal of these two methods. Um, and so, as I talked about just a little bit on that slide, um, was looking at waste separation, right? And so when you think of zero waste, a lot of times you hear about recycling, you hear about composting, you hear about reusing um, products and things like that. 
Um, and that the reason why it's really important to be a part of this climate action stuff is because it actually, if we did do that separation and created policies um, with the effect of with the efficiency of actually reducing greenhouse gases in that way, then we could actually reduce it by 84% of emissions, which Carlos talked about earlier, but the way of getting there is through that separation of food waste, which currently in our current system is being burnt and also being buried and creating all of these greenhouse gases um, that is on call for if we actually deal with it in the right way. And that's going to take, again, policies um, to get those, um, to get uh, these, this waste sector actually working in the way that it should be. Um, and so one of the things that I was just talking about was food waste um, and also some of the plastics. But when it comes to food waste, it is actually accounted for 10 percent of the global um, greenhouse gas emissions that's happening. Um, we see in Baltimore, actually, um, a little bit in the work that we do. We've talked about how food waste um, is one of the biggest things that's being burnt and also buried in creating that methane and things like that that you have talked about Jennifer earlier. Um, and so that's happening in a lot of communities and some communities are actually attacking that like in Milan where they are actually looking at reducing food waste um, reduction. So even capturing the food waste before it even goes to like being incinerated landfill or anywhere else um, and even composting, right? Cause the best way to get rid of it is to actually eat it. So um, <laughs> that is one way that we actually look at it but also creating composting as an actual way to deal with the food waste that cannot be captured. I think this is you, Jennifer. Yes. So we want to really, really focus in on composting because we know we need to close down the trash incinerators. We know that incineration can't be part of our future. It's the most polluting way of producing electricity. Um, we also need to deal with this landfill methane problem in a really serious way. And the best way to do that is composting. Composting is really a climate game changer because it has an incredible number of benefits for the environment. Um, when you collect your uh, food waste separately, uh, like many communities across Maryland are beginning to offer. And when you compost them, um, it reduces methane emissions from landfills by 62%, even if you're not that serious about it, is what this review by Gaia found. And if you really, really take it seriously, you can drive much deeper emissions than that. Uh, and that is incredibly important because the number of ben the the benefits that compost has across all of society are just incredible. Composting, um, when you're allowing food scraps and other uh, natural waste to decompose um, in the presence of oxygen in a in a natural way, uh, and creating a good soil amendment, it is good for the environment. It's good for the climate because it actually sequesters carbon into the ground when you incorporate that compost into the soil. Um, and then once it's in the soil, it uh, increases the soil fertility. It makes farms um, more able to grow more food and less reliant on uh, artificial fertilizers, which themselves are very polluting. Um, it reduces the need, it increases resilience to floods and droughts, both of which we're, we've been dealing with in Maryland recently, uh, because soil with compost incorporated into it actually can hold more storm water and allow it to filter into the groundwater rather than fl flow out and flood. Um, it improves the soil structure and uh, can even help to filter pollutants. So all of these things are incredibly important for um, climate resiliency, helping us to handle the increased flooding and drought and pollution and erosion that we're going to see in the coming decades because of climate change. And composting is equally as important for climate action. It gets those methane emissions out of the landfills and sequesters the carbon into the ground. And so Maryland moving towards composting is one of the best things, um, one of the most uh, a really powerful thing with a lot of benefits that we can do and should be reflected in the climate pathway plan. And I think I am turning it back to you, Shoshanda.
I mean, no, sorry, this one was mine. Apologies. Um, so, uh, of course, food waste and stuff that you can compost is not the whole picture in terms of our waste. Um, it's between a third and a half, depending on the waste stream of uh, what gets landfilled or burned could be composted. But a lot of what's left is plastics. And we, plastics is a huge problem for the climate. Um, from cradle to grave, uh, plastics uh, produce a lot of climate pollution when their, their source is extracted. Plastics are made from fossil fuels. And so when we are um, drilling or fracking to get fossil fuels to create comp uh, plastics with, it um, creates a lot of pollution. Then the transportation of products, the disposal of products, all of these things um, contribute to plastics creating a lot of um, greenhouse gas emissions. And so getting rid of plastics from the get-go, um, as well as recycling, but also doing source reduction so that we're producing and using fewer plastics in the first place is a really important piece of the puzzle. And another piece of that puzzle is actually looking at the benefits of actually creating zero waste systems on not only the greenhouse gas emissions, but also on health, right? Um, and so what we see is a lot of these different illnesses like cancer, upper respiratory uh, issues, and many others that actually comes from all of these greenhouse gases that's being released um, into the environment. Um, and so zero waste is accounting for like still dealing with the issue of waste, but not um, actually putting people's lives at risk for doing that. So in Baltimore, there was um, a study that came out by the Chesapeake Bay Foundation that actually said that the breast cancer incinerator costs $55 million a year in health damages to residents. Um, and so that is just looking at what it's doing to the to the environment, to the residents' lives here. Um, and it's not worth it, right? Um, it's a dirty form of energy. Um, it's a dirty form, um, and we can do so much better and actually protect the lives of residents and our health. Um, and also stop creating these things with all about natural, our natural resources to then have the indisposal of burning or burying it. That just doesn't make logical sense. Um, it's just not an effective way to deal with our natural resources. Um, you can go to the next one, Jennifer. And so I'll end with this, uh, with this quote um, that says, the waste sector offers a prompt opportunity for cities to take action that will dramatically reduce emissions, strengthen resilience, and provide substantial um, public health and economic benefits. I, I see some folks have got their hands raised. Please hold on to your questions or go ahead and put them in the Q&A and we'll have about 15 minutes for questions and answers at the end of the program. Um, but now uh, we're going to talk about what is actually in the Climate Pathway Draft Report. Um, what isn't in in there that should be, what should be in there that isn't, and what you can do about it. Um, so we're going to really zero in first on um, the waste management section of the report. And I'll walk you through some excerpts so that um, you can see what is in the report for yourself. And then again, if you want to see the whole thing, the whole report is available online, and I'd really encourage folks to take a look at it. Um, but so first, we're going to look at the current policy scenario. This is the part where the, the uh, Maryland Department of the Environment is taking a look at what are the policies that are currently on the books? Uh, how much will they reduce our emissions? How close to our goals are we going to get just based on if we, if we were, and this is a hurdle too, but if we were to fully implement all of the policies that Maryland already has on the books? And they took a look at a couple of things. Um, they took a look at Maryland's landfill methane regulations. Um, these are really important um, because there's a lot of methane that is being produced and going to be produced by food waste and other organic waste that already got buried in landfills over the previous decades. Um, and so some policies that uh, have been being, the state has being been working on recently are going to require landfills to better control those emissions from existing um, waste that's already in the landfills. And that's super important. Uh, it looked at the sustainable materials management policy. Uh, these are voluntary statewide metrics and goals that were released by MDE, the Maryland Department of the Environment, that include um, uh, a goal, again, a voluntary goal for a 10% reduction in the amount of waste that's being generated per person in Maryland. 
Um, and then they took a look at uh, waste diversion programs. This is our favorite one. Um, a bunch of the people on this call have been working really hard for a number of years to um, create waste diversion programs and waste management programs in communities across the state and to um, pass new policies at the state level uh, to create more of these programs. These are super important and we need to do a lot more of them. Um, just a quick call out, one of the biggest landmark policies that advocates were working on for eight years before it finally, finally passed in um, 2021 was the Maryland Organics Recycling and Waste Diversion for Food Residuals um, legislation. This is a really key policy that um, provided some legally binding requirements for getting food waste out of the trash, out of the landfills, and into compost. So that policy said that we passed in 2021 um, that if you're an entity that produces an absurd amount of food waste, we're talking about not an individual household, not even a restaurant at this point, but uh, your large university cafeterias and institutions that produce uh, two or one ton of food waste per week or more. If you're that kind of massive generator of food waste, you're the low hanging fruit for getting a lot of food waste out of the landfill. We're taking a close look at you. And so this policy uh, said that if you're one of those entities generating a ton of food waste, and if a compost facility is available to you in a certain radius um, nearby enough for you to matter, uh, then you cannot just put your food waste in the trash. Um, you can send it to that compost facility. You can compost it yourself. Something that's really important is you can also rescue that food and get it to a food pantry, which is the highest and best use. Um, but you just can't put it in the landfill. And these kinds of legally binding um, policies to get food waste out of the trash um, are super, super important for climate action. So then the next section is uh, in the report is the additional policies. So based on what's currently on the books, what more is the report recommending that we do? And this is not an excerpt. This is the whole entire section. Um, the additional policies section does not recommend any additional policies. It just uh, generally says that it's assumed that annual waste diversion efforts drive an additional 10% reduction from the baseline methane emissions um, through 2050. So that's 10% additional reduction over the course of almost five decades. And we know from what we already saw in the zero waste to zero emissions report that we can achieve way, way, way more um, with a lot of benefits for local communities if we take zero waste a lot more seriously. So it's incredibly important that we advocate and that we speak out to make sure that the final draft of the Climate Pathway Report goes for much more than 10% additional reductions and name specific policies that Maryland should pass to help us get there. And so now what we're looking at is the modeling results section of the waste management section. Uh, they uh, modeled the total uh, emissions in Maryland from landfills, from wastewater, which is its own uh, source of emissions, and from incineration. So looking at this graph, you'll see the current policy scenario with the dotted line. So that's the uh, just looking at the policies that are currently on the books that we were talking about. It's projecting that we'll get um, the emissions reductions that you see on the dotted line there by 2050. And then with the additional policy policies that they're contemplating um, with this just overall nebulously 10% reduction from the baseline methane emissions from landfills, you see they're saying with that additional 10% reduction, uh, we can achieve this little change, um, this little amount of additional emissions reductions by 2050. But um, again, anyone who's heard Clean Water Action or South Baltimore Land Trust talk before probably knows what our issue is with this graph. Um, you'll see the incineration emissions being modeled in that darkest color at the top of the graph continue as constant through 2050. 
And that is absolutely unacceptable. That cannot be part of the final plan. Maryland needs to be planning to no longer be burning our trash. And local communities are already planning to no longer burn our trash. And I'll turn it to Shoshanda. Yeah, you know, I like you said, I think this graph is very, very ridiculous because when we have our local government that's saying things like, um, we don't plan to even renew a contract with this incinerator in the next few years. Um, and then you have this graph that's extending it until 2050, just does it add up? Um, and I think you see a lot of communities who are trying who are working desperately to step away from incinerators um and having their representatives say the same thing. Like I was, our mayor said that we weren't gonna have that contract again. Um and so the the same way that we are feeling, I think he should be feeling also, right? Because it's just like, this is not, it, it has no step away or phase out of incineration. It's clearly still a part of, um, a part of how we deal with solid waste and that just shouldn't be. Absolutely. Um, so now we're gonna t take a look at the little additional, um, the additional content in this section where they're taking a look at considerations for policy implementation. And there's some good stuff in this section and there's some bad stuff. Um, the section does mention zero waste. It talks about the need to work on a, um, uh, work on a set of policies that can move us towards uh, uh, getting waste out of the landfills and the incinerators to, um, to uh, methods of management that do more benefits for the local communities, but it uh, doesn't get into those specific recommended policies that would help us drive emissions down even further. Um, it mentions composting barriers and opportunities. It focuses a lot on individual composting, which is really important. And we there are definitely a lot of barriers to overcome there. And um, our local and state governments need to do a lot to make sure that everyone is able to compost their food scraps or send their food scraps to be able to be composted. Um, we also need to focus a lot on the large producers of food waste, um, not your individual household, but cafeterias, restaurants, the places that are producing huge amounts of food waste, those are the biggest bangs for the buck. Um, that's where we can really get a lot of food waste out of the landfill in the incinerator with, with comparatively, compared to dealing with each individual household, um, a lot less effort. And so this section should really talk about what can we do to make sure that the big food waste producers, the big cafeterias um, in places with a lot of food waste are being required to uh, compost or divert that food waste for better uses. Um, and then finally, there's one element that absolutely needs to come out of the final report. And that is a, um, a note that uh, the state could change the way it's counting incinerator emissions just with the stroke of a pen. Um, it's saying that the uh, a certain accounting methodology used by EPA, which itself has a lot of problems. Um, they partially discount um, some of the emissions from incinerators because they come from biogenic sources. And what are biogenic sources? That is the exact material that could be composted. So this, this um, little note in the report really needs to come out. The state absolutely should not change the way it's modeling emissions in this way, because creating a sort of emissions reductions on paper, just changing how you're calculating it, doesn't change the actual emissions in the air and holds us back from taking the real action that we need to take. So this recommendation absolutely needs to come out of the final report. So that covers the solid waste management section. And we're going to touch on some related topics really quickly in the, um, in the electricity generation section. And this has to do with some emerging problems in Maryland, um, much like trash incineration, that if left unchecked and if the recommendation here actually happens would create a lot more pollution in a lot more communities across the state similar to what Baltimore has faced and Montgomery County has faced from the trash incinerator. And that is um, what's called biogas and what's called biomass. And uh, Maria and Sonia are going to talk um, in more detail about this. I'm just going to show you what's in the pathway report itself. Uh, this is a graph from the electricity sector section that's looking at 
what are the power sources that we want to see on the grid at each of these five-year marks um, that will be powering Maryland uh, across the board? And you'll see there um, coal and gas getting to a smaller percentage and then going away. You see wind and solar really growing, which is really exciting. Um, but you also see the striped sections of biomass and um, gas. And those, uh, the, the report is saying that they expect, want, recommend um, natural gas, biogas bio, bio to um, be introduced in the 2030s. This is something that is not in Maryland now. And to eventually get to 2% of in-state generation of energy by 2045. And then similarly, biomass to be introduced in 2030. Again, this is something that isn't present in Maryland now and to only make up less than 1% of the gener generation mix of the energy mix in Maryland in 2045. And much like trash incineration, these are polluters. These are ways of manage managing our waste that do a lot of harm to the local communities. And this recommendation that Maryland create from scratch, things that don't exist right now in um, producing biogas and producing biomass absolutely has to come out of the final report. And um, now for the expert view on biogas, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Maria. Unfortunately today, we got news uh, that um, deeper Delaware we had uh, a proposal from Bioenergy Debco for an anaerobic digester, uh, which you can see there in the picture on the right. Um, they wanted to put this in an ag residential community where the two closest uh, groups of folks, one about a half mile, the other a mile, um, are um, folks that are linguistically isolated. Uh, high uh, Haitian Creole population and Latinx population. Um, we had filed, have filed, uh, the Title VI Civil Rights um, Administrative Complaint, which by the way has not been uh, ruled on yet, opened or closed. So I was very shocked um, to see that this was approved today. Uh, it's the same story that Shashanda was talking about, all of our speakers prior. Um, this is not green energy. Burning things is not, um, it's actually contributing to um, more detriment to our air quality and our health. Um, along with, this is more water soluble and it has a byproduct with the biogas, um, which has to be land applied. Uh, I'm not sure how many folks realize, but Delaware has the highest percentage um, in our country of polluted rivers and streams with 97.5% of our rivers and streams polluted, 100% of our estuaries. When Delaware cannot manage its own waste, to think that we are going to bring in 250,000 tons of waste from multiple states into this uh, residential community <laughs> where you have threats of explosions, bringing in up to 73,000 additional trucks per year. Um, it's a safety issue. It's a health issue, um, but it's a greenwashing issue. We all know this is not green energy. Uh, I come from a state in Pennsylvania where the fracking, we had it. And we heard the same stories, the clean green, it was going to be transition. Um, didn't happen, no health studies prior to. And Shoshana just quoted, you know, with the Chesapeake Bay uh, report. This is increasing healthcare costs. We have families, we have children. Um, it, this is not the way to go. And I think anybody that looks and really looks into these reports and what we're considering green energy needs to realize and it's common sense. It really is. It's not. Um, Maryland, we did stop one facility uh, that was going to be cited there and they're still looking um, and greasing the wheels in the, in the meantime. I'm watching donations and all kinds of goodies going, going around. 
So um, folks really should be just laying in, trying to get comments in. We can do better. Um, education, get the youth involved. Um, we, ha we have to stand together. We have to stand together. And we can do better. Thanks, Maria, and thanks for being here. Um, and again, just to uh, put a put, put a fine point on it, this is an industry that does not exist in Maryland yet, um, and we absolutely need to keep it that way for the health of the communities um, on the eastern shore that may face have faced proposals that have not been built and will face more again if uh, this is part of the climate plan for Maryland's future. Uh, the second uh, emerging threat is woody biomass, and I am going to turn it over to the experts here um, with Sonia. Thank you very much, um, and thank you everyone for being here and um, paying attention. So uh, as Jennifer and Shoshanda eloquently exposed, the Maryland um, Pathways Report does insist on continuing through the RPS system, which means um, incentives for incineration. And um, in it, it says that on page um, 32, it will include um, energy sources such as solar, wind, hydropower, and other alternatives to fossil fuels, including biomass and biogas. So woody biomass for energy has been declared clean and renewable and therefore is receiving incentives from uh, utility rate payers. Um, it is not clean at all. Woody biomass is basically wood. And when it's burned, it emits as much um, CO2 as coal, basically. Um, in addition to that, it adds emissions from logging, which can be up to 10% of the global G, um, greenhouse gas emissions at this point. We are learning a lot about the in, impact of logging itself. We will lose the soil carbon and through the, especially through the arboriscal mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, transport emissions are added and then the pellet factories and thermal projects, which are being planned in Maryland right now, are all going to be scheduled to be put into opportunity zones. Um, and then we have the emissions from a second um, global round of transport and finally the burning and the emission of the CO2. So woody biomass should not in any way or form be burned. Um, it should be encapsulated or used to generate um, and improve soils. Um, and the next slide. The second part is that um, biomass is also not renewable, not within the time frame that we're looking at. Um, right now in Maryland, we're planting 5 million seedlings they will take around 30 years to start being effective in removing pollution. What we need to keep right now is to um, really preserve the forests we have. We are very lucky that we have 70% of our forests are mature in Maryland. Most of these, in fact, are being owned, um, are owned by individuals. So anybody who knows anyone, please do not log those forests. We need them right now. Um, so in order to maximize carbon capture potential, that is the key thing we need to do. However, the industry has also seen that we um, have these beautiful forests and um, there is an economic adjustment strategy that is being uh, worked on by industry and the government right now. Uh, elected officials are being lobbied um, and that uh, strategy is seeking an exponential growth of timber trade and it has a massive push for woody biomass. I know you saw that it was probably um, planning on being one or 2% by 2050. However, if we have the incentives in place to let the industry get established in Maryland, then um, our forests are gonna go, go and we will have some the pellet factories in our opportunity zones amongst our uh, most vulnerable communities and the pellets will be shipped overseas. Um, the same thing with thermal projects. Um, there's also a big push for clean heat standards. Again, there is a lot of money in our forests right now, but we need them to be preserved. Now, I, we don't have much time at all, so I put a link to some educational modules up in the left corner. It's climatecc.org forward slash forests. There is a um, module on biomass and then another one on the Maryland Forestry Economic Adjustment Strategy and uh, the threats it poses to us. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, Sonia. Um, so to wrap it all up, um, we've put a lot in front of you tonight, but we really want to close out by focusing on what needs to be said, what should be in comments that go to the Maryland Department of the Environment about the Climate Pathway Report, and then how you can get that com those comments to them yourself. So first, we need to say no to pollution in Maryland's climate pathway in Maryland's future. Uh, the waste management section 
should include a specific recommendation in that additional policy section that says we will stop incinerating our trash. And if you remember how big of a chunk of the emissions trash incineration was, that will make a big difference in itself. And then the other half of no to pollution, the electricity sector section should not include this recommendation to bring in biogas and biomass industries to Maryland. We've seen the harm that using waste to energy has caused um, to the communities dealing with trash incinerators. We don't want to see that harm replicated in communities needing to deal with biogas and biomass. That's what we want to say no to, but just as important as what we want to say yes to. We should see specific policy recommendations in the waste management section. We know that there are policies the state can take, can pass to reduce emissions, divert waste, build composting, and that those can drive greater emissions reductions than that 10% that's nebulously in the report right now. So we need specific additional policies. And to say a word about that, I'm going to bring up Emily Ranson, Clean Water Action's Chesapeake Director, to talk about some of those specific policies Maryland can include in the report. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. So specifically on this aspect of waste management and composting, one of the things to note in the report is that they are talking about the desire for mutually reinforcing climate strategies. And so outside of just the waste sector benefits of getting uh, food waste and its associated carbon emissions out of landfills and trash incinerators, we also have the potential for carbon sequestration into soils. And then we have the benefit of promoting healthier soils, uh, creating robust local economies. And one aspect that we are submitting comments on, and I think it's just something to really think about, is the potential for compost as a substitution for synthetic fertilizers in agriculture. So, you know, it is this great circular economy, this way of being able to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in the waste sector and promote healthier soils, you know, a more sustainable agricultural system. So really looking forward to seeing how the state can really realize a lot of these great uh, co-benefits, mutually reinforcing strategies, as they call them. So that's what we're hoping you will say. And finally, uh, to close us out, how you can say it. Uh, Shoshanda? Yeah, so again, we talked about some of these listening sessions that's been happening. Um, there is a few more that are that is coming up. One of them is in Baltimore, um, and then one of them is in Southern Maryland, um, the College of Southern Maryland. And then there is another one that's 2026, which is wherever you are, you can join. It's virtual. <laughs> um, and so you can make your comments there. Um, you can also submit written comments online. Um, and let's, I hope you all do that. You know, I think the more of us that submit, the better um, to get these points across. Um, because yes, this plan has already put it out, but I think that it is not enough if it doesn't actually suffice to all of us, which it doesn't because it actually doesn't even talk about, again, the phase out of incinerators or actually having that diverting method to actually increase composting or these other policies that would instantly actually bring, bring down greenhouse gases. So please join one of these sessions. I'm going to request all of you guys here um, to try to make one of them. Thank and you so much. I think we're opening to questions. And yes. Absolutely. So um, I'm going to stop screen sharing now and um, we are going to answer your questions in the Q&A. Um, so first, uh, here's a kind of specific question that I think I can toss to you, Emily. Um, we have questions about will the policies, I, I think, Kathy, you were asking about the policies already on the books about diverting food waste away um, from incinerators and landfills, whether those include hospitals. And then we also have a question about stadiums. Yeah, I believe the answer to both of those should be yes, as long as they are currently doing over two tons of organic waste a week. Uh, so the Maryland Department of the Environment on this specific law has been doing a really good job of both promoting the legislation, educating people about the legislation, 
and requirements. And then also they actually have put on their website. So the organic diversion page about this uh, facilities are able to apply for waivers. If there is a hardship in uh, complying with the regulation and MDE posts about all of the ones that they have granted. I believe last I checked, they only had like two or three. So, you know, pretty, pretty good numbers. And one of those was actually a university uh, who was looking to delay until the start of the new school year. So, you know, they've been doing a real good job of uh, rolling it out and, you know, it, uh, assuring compliance isn't quite the word, but, you know, making sure that waivers are granted for as little time as required uh, to get that to happen. Great. And maybe a question for Shishanda or Emily or me. What is the compact of impact of composting food waste on methane and greenhouse gas emissions? So are we talking about the scale of it? Um, so in terms of the actual tonnage, but that's probably not the question being asked. The impact in and of itself is when organic waste is sent to a landfill, it's going to decompose in without oxygen. So that's an anaerobic decomposition. So without <laughs> oxygen uh, rotting. Uh, what's interesting about, or what's different about the compost strategy is that that is more of an aerobic. So with oxygen, not quite rotting, but you know, <laughs> falling apart, uh, turning brown, turning into soil. And so that's one of the reasons why if you've ever done a compost pile at home, it's important to turn it. It's important to, you know, have a good mix of, you know, woody, bulky materials that allows oxygen to sit in there. So that is um, why the, why compost is such an effective carbon sequestration uh, strategy for the waste sector. Definitely. Shoshanda or Carlos, anything to add? Nope. <laughs> I think she got it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Joyce. Given the difficulty of recycling plastics, that most plastics are not recycled, and that in the process of recycling them, microplastics are generated and further pollute our soils, air, and, air and water, should we be promoting the elimination of plastics and packaging, single-use plastics, etc.? That's a really important piece of the puzzle. Yeah, recycling is better than burning or burying. Um, it does save energy. It saves materials but it does have its own problems. Um, that's not to say that we shouldn't recycle at all. Recycling is very important. Um, it's extremely important for paper, plastic, and metal. Uh, sorry, for paper and metal and materials like that. For plastic, it is a lot better to use as little plastic as we possibly can, not even produce it in the first place because of those life, life cycle emissions from drilling, uh, fossil fuels to create plastic, to transport it, to use it, and then to burn or bury it. All throughout that cycle is creating emissions. So recycling is the uh, the best thing to do once you've got it, but the far better thing is not to have it at all. Yeah, and I will also plug that Gaia also did a report, a five-tail report that actually goes through five communities. Baltimore is one of them. Um, and it talks about the um, recycling of single-use plastics. And we have, ours is only being recycled at like 2.5%, right? And so there was just this disconnect of a myth that plastic was being recycled by residents who were putting it in their blue bins, but it just wasn't going there. Um, and so I think it, I think it's very important to talk about the strategy of like talking about what we're producing and that's what the zero waste hierarchy is, It's looking at, um, redesigning of products. So looking at the products we don't need and eliminating them, that is a portion that, that can't be just like overlooked. So absolutely what you said is absolutely true. We should not be producing it at all. Absolutely. Um, from, uh, we have a question, did the Baltimore mayor and other leaders speak out about ending incineration or beginning citywide composting? Shoshanda? They actually did. So before our mayor, uh, Brandon Scott was actually elected, we did a video, a uh, hosting with, uh, residents and many people around Baltimore city that demanded them to actually talk through 
what their demands is going to be around the incinerator. And so he actually ran on that. And so he committed to saying like, um, the incinerator wasn't the way that we should actually be dealing with solid waste and we have to phase that out. And he said in his own exact words that we will not be signing another contract with them. And so, of course, that means we have to develop the systems to actually look at what we're producing and how do we divert it from this, from this incinerator. Um, and the first thing that we talked about was food waste. Um, it makes up 40% of the waste grain in Baltimore. So it is a big chunk that can actually be taken out, right? Um, and as you heard in this pathway report, they talk about individuals actually composting, but this first portion was actually looking at businesses um, because of that uh, bill that was produced that says that if you produce more than one ton of two tons or um, of food waste, then you can no longer send it to that if you have access to like a compost facility or something like that. Um, and so we've been looking at these bigger companies and these bigger businesses that is creating a lot of food waste and how do we get them to start diverting it, which our mayor has came out and directly said on video, um, because we, of course we record everything, um, that he, um, that we actually did need to start diverting the food waste, starting with food waste, diverting it from the incinerator into, um, a new system. And so, yeah, that is what our mayor has said. And we are every day trying to hold him accountable to that. Absolutely. And I'll mention as well, um, there's been very specific firm commitments from Baltimore city leaders about no, not signing another contract with the trash incinerator. And the situation is similar in Montgomery County. The elected officials there have been very specific and clear that they do not want to continue burning trash and that they want to close down the trash incinerator in Montgomery County as soon as possible. So even just based on the commitments of the local governments, we should see trash incineration ending in the modeling in this report well before 2050. And um, to close out the questions, um, the all of the links um, to reports that we've cited um, are in the chat. Uh, I see that there's been some difficulty copying things out of the chat. We will also include that in a follow-up email to y'all on Friday. Um, and to close out the last question, um, also including a recording of the webinar. So you can refresh yourself, send it to your friends, get everybody excited about taking action on this, um, attending the listening session in Baltimore on the 12th coming up next or one of the future ones or submitting written comments. Um, so lots of ways to take action. Thank you so much for everybody for being with us tonight. We really appreciate your attention on these important issues and look forward to taking action together to fight incineration, biogas and biomass and build this zero waste future in Maryland. So thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Jennifer, Shoshana, Maria. Got it. Ciao.